welcome everyone to the Halvum Department of Population and Family Health Spring 2021 seminar series. Um, today's seminar is the second part of a two part series on um, the global health justice and governance programs work. Our speakers today will uh, discuss gender based violence, SRHR and COVID-19 in Colombia, Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa and Uganda. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to our to our moderator today, Dr. Sarah Kiesky. Thanks, Lizzie. I'm going to start by introducing our three speakers today. Um, Nitu John specializes in population and reproductive health, primarily worked in Africa and Asia. Her work explores linkages between women's empowerment, household dynamics, gender-based violence, and sexual and reproductive health. Golin Samari will be our next speaker. She's a public health demographer and assistant professor focused on social inequities and in health domestically and globally. And our final speaker is new to the department. She just joined as associate director of the Global Health Justice and Governance Program, Clarissa Bencomo. She has worked globally on human rights governance and philanthropy as a policy researcher, activist, and a grant maker, most recently leading the Ford Foundation's Middle East and North Africa programming. Um, so we're going to start with our the presentation. Feel free to put questions in the chat, and then we'll have time for Q&A um, after the presentation. So I'm going to hand it over to Michu. Hi, everyone. Just a minute. I'm going to try and share my screen. Does that look good? Okay, great. It's good. Thank you for join, joining us today. We are really excited to share findings from a, from a five country study that looked at the impact of COVID related policies on GBV and SRH services. So here is an outline of our presentation. So we'll start by giving you a brief study overview. Then we'll go into the findings, starting with the interview findings and then talk about our funding analysis, and then end with a discussion of opportunities governments missed that could have changed the outcomes for many women and girls. So why was this an important study to do in this moment in time? So government policies to contain pandemics such as quarantine, school closures, and redirecting human and financial resources towards emergency health service provision can directly and indirectly harm women if their gendered unintended consequences are not proactively countered. The restrictive policies can indirectly harm women and girls by exacerbating pre-existing gender-based inequalities and power differences. For example, women and girls can have greater exposure to violence as stay-at-home orders leave them trapped with their perpetrators for long periods of time. The loss of livelihood and economic strain caused uh, by the pandemic can increase household stress and expose women and girls to heightened aggression. More directly, as resources are diverted towards emergency, emergency service provision, life-saving critical health and social services are often deprioritized and or deemed non-essential and become scarce, heightening the vulnerability of women and girls. Factors such as fear of getting infected in public spaces, disruption of regular transportation or services, increases in costs, imposition of curfew, and the fear of being mistreated by the police as they impose government restrictions may further discourage women and girls from accessing critical services. Early reports suggest that COVID was going to be no different. Given this background, we did a rapid five country study. Our goal was to understand if governments were deeming GBV and SRH services essential as they imposed restrictive policies to contain the pandemic and how services and programs and ultimately women and girls were being affected by these policies. We also track the impact of the pandemic on GBV and SRH funding. This is mapped with the location of the five countries. You know, we had countries across the regions in Africa, and then we also looked at Colombia to get a sense of what was happening in South America. So most of the data was collected between July and August. We had in-country consultants who interviewed GBV and SRH service providers program managers and donors. 
Between 20 to 35 individuals were interviewed in each of the countries. In total, 27 donors and 91 providers were interviewed across the five countries. We gathered additional information with desk reviews and web-based surveys. Today, we will be mostly presenting findings from the interviews and the desk review. So before going into the interview findings and the funding analysis, wanted to give you a brief description of the COVID-related policy context in these countries. So this slide highlights COVID-19 containment policies that were affected at the national level for each of the countries. As you can see, there were stringent restrictions early in the pandemic in March and April. Schools were closed and lockdowns and curfews imposed almost immediately. Transportation was restricted in all of the countries. Each country had specific mandates. However, from May through August, lockdowns, curfews and transportation restrictions were loosened. There was some confusion about the official GDV policy from national governments at the start of the pandemic. This slide highlights the first official statement or guidance from governments about GDV services. In all the four African countries, governments declared GDV services essential only after public outcry or media attention was drawn to the issue or because of advocacy by GBV stakeholders as GBV cases began to surge in the countries. Although health services in general remained essential, SRH was not prioritized at the start of the pandemic. Across the board, no clear guidelines were issued on how the availability of services would be ensured with the restrictions in place. Moving into the interview findings. So the overarching themes across whether you look at GBV or SRH services, you, you, we found a lack of preparedness to deal with GBV and SRH during emergencies. This put a tremendous stress on an already weak health and social protection system in these countries. There was widespread disruption of services at the start of the pandemic. There was confusion among service providers around what was essential versus non-essential. And as anticipated, lockdown, curfew restrictions, transportation restrictions, made it especially hard to access services even if they were available. Other factors such as police mistreatment, fear of catching COVID-19 in public spaces, confusion over what services were available, increases in the costs of services, further restricted access. When we look at GBV services, we find there was an increased demand for GBV services, but services were not available. Other than the health sector, all other GBV sectors were not deemed essential in the beginning, which led to disruption of services as well as referral pathways. In the initial months, the police were preoccupied with imposing COVID-19 restrictions and were not registering GBV cases. Legal and judicial services were deemed non-essential and not available for the most part. Shelters, which are a scarce commodity even during normal times in these countries, while generally available, were oversubscribed and could not handle the increases in demand. Some had to close because of shortages of basic supplies such as food. Also hard to access due to all the travel restrictions. GBV clinical services also deprioritized and, and also hard to access again due to the restrictions. So this disruption of complementary services had compounding impacts. For example, in Kenya, women were unable to register GBV cases and obtain timely protection orders. Perpetrators were given lenient bail terms to reduce congestion in prisons. And women trying to flee their perpetrators had no place to go as shelters were full. Also all community-based prevention and psychosocial support services that play an important role in awareness raising and connecting survivors to essential services halted activities, leaving survivors with no support systems. Even when services were available, Restrictive policies and related factors meant that survivors had to face tremendous hardships to access services. On a positive note, as GBV surged in the countries and the need for services became clear, several GBV stakeholders stepped up and found ways to provide critical services to women and girls. Service providers, including the police, increasingly began using hotlines and other online platforms to register GBV cases as well as connect survivors to health and psychosocial services. Courts began using virtual platforms. New shelters were being identified and set up 
There's also growing recognition that technology-based services are limited in their ability to support a large majority of women and girls in the countries. And there's increasing push to create community-based systems and solutions to provide support and access to services. Here are some illustrative quotes from Uganda, Nigeria that highlight the challenges service providers faced in providing services because governments did not deem all GBV sectors essential. I'll give you a few moments to read the quote. Moving on to SRH services and programs. Although health services were deemed essential, like GBV, SRH services were also deprioritized. Some health facilities, especially SRH or HIV clinics, closed because of this. Facilities closed for deep cleaning when staff contracted COVID, and many NGOs initially suspended operations as they developed new ways of working, leading to inconsistent availability of services when reducing clients' options adding to the confusion of what services were available and where. Some facilities turned away clients seeking SRH services who did not have COVID symptoms. Access was further reduced due to difficulties related to things already discussed, such as the curfew, the transportation issues, inclu including the increases in cost of transportation, the fear of catching COVID, the mistreatment by the police, and the harassment that people experienced when leaving homes. While delivery care was mostly seen as essential, pregnant women had to get permits to travel to facilities or were harassed without them in some countries. Preventive care, like the number of ANC and PNC visits were reduced. Contraceptive supply chain issues were also mentioned across the board as airports closed and transportation was restricted. Providers discouraged LARC to minimize client contact. Family planning clients decreased preference for LARCs since they did not want to spend long periods of time with health workers. Hard to know which of these was more prevalent though. Although respondents in Uganda reported uh, availability in ART provision, most countries reported client difficulties in obtaining resupply, again related to reasons such as transportation restrictions and curfews and other challenges of leaving their homes. Condoms at supermarkets and pharmacies were barricaded uh, during lockdown in some countries, particularly in South Africa, because they were not deemed as essential goods despite the high HIV prevalence. NGOs suspended community activities, gradually restarting them with smaller groups as restrictions eased, which had cost implications. The barriers and solutions are similar to what we just described for GBV community work. CBOs that provide community outreach often diverted to COVID social mobilization to keep themselves afloat as funding dried up. The closure of school programs was often a key barrier in reaching adolescents. Some solutions that were being used to counteract these challenges include use of Uber motorcycles to bring pregnant women for delivery, use of telehealth wherever possible for FP services, but growing concerns around confidentiality calling in abortion medicine prescriptions to a pharmacy, providing three months supply of OCPs rather than one month, scheduling appointments to reduce congestion, using community-based organizations and community health workers, as well as Ubers and motorbike drivers to deliver medicines to people living with HIV, but concerns that home visits can create stigma. Virtual platforms are being used for community awareness campaigns, but again, there's a recognition that these those least likely to access services prior to the pandemic are also least likely to have access to phones and internet. Community radio is now playing an important role in bridging some of these gaps. Here's a quote from Colombia that highlights the challenges in accessing SRH and abortion services. We'll give you a moment to read it. 
hear a quote from Kenya and South Africa that show how family planning and even maternal health services were deprioritized. Again, I'll give you a minute to take a look. Over to Goleen from here on. Thank you, Dr. John. So I'm going to highlight, um, just as any crisis or epidemic uh, brings to surface, some populations that are what we call unfunded and underserved. So these are groups that really emerge through the research as sort of lacking the necessary attention, resources, and services because of the pandemic response in terms of GBV and SRH. So the first group that really emerged as vulnerable and really underserved were adolescents. So there were increased reports of adolescent pregnancy, transactional sex, sexual violence, STIs, HIV, um, and FGM in Kenya, South Africa, Uganda, and Colombia. Community edu uh, education was really reduced for youth and youth were really affected by school closures um, and a lack of emphasis on child protection services. There are lots of reports of being at home with an abuser, for example, in Colombia. And then school closures meant adolescents did not have an excuse to seek confidential care for contraception, HIV treatment, and otherwise. Um, there were reports of that from South Africa. Um, school closures also disrupted school-based programming um, and SRH prevention services for adolescents really declined through telemedicine and teleconsultation. Another group that emerged as um, underserved were LGBTQ individuals. So in Kenya and Uganda, LGBTQ communities were seen as not reporting GBV for fear of safety. In South Africa, um, there were few shelters that really served LGBTQ communities. Um, and many were so highly affected by the lockdowns as they didn't have permanent homes. So lockdowns actually resulted in them becoming homeless. Um, in Colombia, attacks against LGBTQ people continued even amid the COVID-19 lockdowns. And there's been reports in Colombia of political gains and increased representation for LGBTQ individuals, but discrimination really persists. For example, in Colombia's coastal region, there were 50, at least 15 homicides against LGBTQ people um, and lots of increased reports of violence at the hands of police. Um, a striking example is on May 29th, the Trans Community Network reported that Alejandra, a trans sex worker who had, art, who had called for an ambulance due to symptoms of COVID-19, was refused ambulance service when the crew learned that she was HIV positive and she died shortly thereafter. So these groups were really um, emerged as underserved and very vulnerable. Next slide, please. Related to that, um, another group that emerged is sex workers. So there was a lot of reports of uh, loss of income due to lockdown measures and fear of being infected with COVID-19, for example, in South Africa and Kenya. Um, there was also impaired access to sexual reproductive health services for sex workers because of the lack of ability to afford transportation to clinics. Um, and also in Kenya, for example, uh, sex workers reported their, um, they were unable to visit clinics as they were working during the day due to curfew hours. Um, there was also increased cases of police harassment of female sex workers who violated curfew hours to, to earn a living in Kenya and Colombia. There was also a rise in young girls turning to sex work, particularly Venezuelan migrants in Colombia. Um, and their respondents really pointed to cases of girls engaging in transactional sex to buy food and sanitary items. So a lot of um, respondents were uh, reporting girls turning to this work just to meet their basic needs. Another group that emerged um, as underserved are migrants and refugees. So uh, there was this sort of theme of women without access to internet or smartphones or to access services virtually being hard to reach um, in Nigeria and Colombia. And a lot of times these were um, migrant groups. 
Um, migrants and displaced people also report a difficulty in accessing GBV programs and services due to police harassment or lack of proper documentation in both South Africa and Colombia. Um, there's been a lot of reports of Venezuelan migrants having had difficulty accessing abortion in Colombia and more later term pregnancies because services for the migrant women were located really far away. Um, basically, the unequal access to the healthcare system for migrants is really has been really further aggravated by the COVID-19 crisis, um, and the slow response of the Colombian government to migration issues was largely criticized before the pandemic outbreak. Um, another population to point out that's particularly relevant for the Colombian context is the Afro-descendant um, population. So. The pandemic has not curbed socio-political violence in Colombia. On the contrary, it's really affirmed the power of some of the armed groups. Um, and so discrimination for these groups remains, um, for the Afro-descendant populations rem remains a, a, a top issue, um, which creates unequal access for both supplies and healthcare. Armed groups in Colombia have imposed curfews, lockdowns, and other measures to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, and they attack those who don't follow their guidelines. Um, so many of these groups really have, these underserved groups overall have really experienced violence, including sexual and gender-based violence, and most vulnerable groups of women, particularly Afro-descendant, indigenous, rural, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender women, and women with disabilities, disproportionately suffer serious uh, violations without state protection or access to justice. Next slide, please. So another thing to highlight is the impact on NGO operations. So we heard from interviewees about devastating impacts on NGO operations during the COVID-19 response. So NGOs halted activities or transitioned to remote work like everybody else as COVID restrictions were imposed. We heard that a small um, number of local community-based organizations were affected more than sort of large uh, INGOs. And some even had to scale down or close operations, even though most of the times the CBO's work is actually on the front lines. Um, many NGOs also had to adapt to working in smaller groups and faced high costs from working from home and the technology required for this. Next slide, please. So there is also an impact on donors and funding, the funding response. So, there's basically devastating impacts on funding for NGOs. NGOs reported that individual and corporate donors both reduced funding, which, which again, especially affected smaller organizations. Um, there was some increase in funding among foreign donors, donors though um, bilaterals made it difficult for GBV organizations in particular to make budget adjustments. That was reported in Uganda. So reallocation of funds, mainly from private foundations, were permitted to cover some unforeseen costs such as laptops or fuel for generators and internet data in Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. But ultimately there were some um, funding shifts and constraints, which I will pass on to Clarissa to discuss further. Okay, so Looking at the big picture for funding stream, I think what is most striking is globally, there's virtually no donor funds earmarked for GBV and SRHR in the COVID response throughout the full period of 2020. If we look at the DEVEX numbers of investments and grants uh, in COVID response, $20.67 trillion globally only 55 million of that has been earmarked for violence against women and girls. Uh, and no way of tracking in that funding for SRHR. Now, this isn't just bad reporting, although there are huge data gaps about who and what is being funded. But when we look at the strategies that donors are using to address COVID needs, we see that GBV and SRHR aren't prominent in most COVID funding strategies. Uh, and we see this very clearly when we look at our five countries. So if we can have the next slide, please. Um, 
actually, sorry, go back one slide. Um, if we look at the if we look at the five countries from January through July, where we have the most complete data, we see that the international financial institutions are the largest source of COVID response funding. But only the World Bank has earmarked any money for GBV or SRHR. And it's, as you can see, very small amounts. Um, Nigeria is a little bit of an exception in, in the funding from the IFIs because they did receive some World Bank support for SRHR and GBV through regular projects because they already had some ongoing World Bank support for child health and girls, but across the board, tiny, tiny amounts in IFI. Um, and if we look at the big uh, COVID response appeals, we see that GBV and SRHR projects aren't prominent asks in any of the 2020 UN-led COVID response country appeals. And where there are included as asks, there's little evidence that the projects that are included are actually being funded. Next slide, please. When we look at who's funding SR, HR and GVV, the first thing we see is that most of the typical GBV and SRHR donors aren't very active in this period. Uh, donor governments across the board have been slow to earmark new funds for GBV and SRHR in the COVID response. And the EU member states in particular have been under pressure to fund their COVID response out of existing budgets under the EU's Team Europe um, push. We also see that some traditional GBV donors uh, delayed their flagship GBV programs planned for 2020. So Canada is a great example of that. They had a massive uh, global GBV program that was delayed for several months and then has only been trickling out in much smaller amounts than they had initially planned. Where we do see is the largest source of new SRHR funding was the Global Fund for, uh, for AIDS, uh, malaria, and tuberculosis. Uh, they provided new funding for addressing the impact of COVID on HIV, TB, and malaria programs. But we don't yet know the net impact of these programs for funding for HIV once funds are reallocated across all programs because the, the new push with the global fund has been for greater flexibility to use existing grant funds to address the COVID response, but we don't know how countries are shifting money around. When we look at foundations, we see the foundations are funding the COVID response, but almost none of this funding has been earmarked for GBV or SRHR. Um, there is some non-COVID funding that we can talk about later for GBV and SRHR from the foundations. Uh, the Gates Foundation is probably the best example of this with continuing in its existing funding for HIV and maternal and child health. Uh, but for GBV, very, very little foundation funding in this period with Ford and the Global Fund for Women being really the only foundations with any significant non-COVID GBV funding in this period. And when we look at the UN agencies, it's particularly disturbing. Usually when we think about the UN agencies, we are concerned about them sucking up all the funding during an emergency, but this hasn't been the case for UNFPA and UN Women. Uh, they have been largely spending from their regular budgets the agent, UN agencies that are receiving new, uh, significant new funding under COVID response, UNICEF, IOM, UNHCR, have almost no GVV and SRHR programming in their COVID response strategies. Um, and in some countries, they've actually lost ground on this. So um, if we look at Uganda, UNICEF actually reduced its programming on GVB in its new country strategy. Next slide, please. So if we look at the types of funding and interventions for COVID and for non-COVID across the five countries, um, 
between January and July 2020, we see that most COVID funding is for continuity of HIV services and for maternal health. So really areas the donors had uh, already been funding. Um, it's not until the second half of 2020 that we start to see greater funding for inclusion of people living with HIV and for pregnant women in vaccine development primarily through um, new funding from the Gates Foundation. When we look at the non-COVID projects, they're often linked to ongoing services for IDP and refugees, HIV programs, or health sector governance reforms, but they're not large amounts. And so what's really missing from these lists of projects is uh, projects that support accountability for gender-based violence, projects that support broader SRHR programs and programs that address drivers of GBV. Um, so really some GVB response, but very little prevention programming. Next slide, please. So to wrap up, we just wanted to talk a little bit about missed opportunities. So we see in this a clear need to integrate SRHR and GBV strategies and funding into national emergency preparedness planning. Um, what, and there are clearly good international guidance supporting this. So there's the Sendai Framework for Disaster Re Reduction 2015 to 2030, which calls for increased attention to resilience it identifies health and specifically SRHR as a critical aspect of in strengthening individual and community resilience. Um, also notable in this regard is the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction, thematic platform for health. Uh, this working group is developing guidance to operationalize mainstreaming of SRHR and GBV in its activities. We also see a great a huge uh, need to link policy to implementation. Um, in particular, as we talked about earlier on, the need to make sure that people are aware of policy developments and that the new policies are put into practice. Uh, we see a need to involve multiple sectors in emergency response policies. So for example, not only the health sector, but also justice and security sectors. So for example, please don't harass or arrest women who are seeking care that they're entitled to, as we saw in a number of the countries we looked at. Um, for issues around access to education related to school co closures. And with regard to funding, um, huge issues around both earmarking and transparency. So earmarking with clear transparency and indicators of what's being funded, um, clarity specifically around this issue that GBV and SRHR are essential services, and spe specificity about what these services must include. So to make sure that they include access to justice, uh, adolescent health, contraception, STI prevention, elective abortion, et cetera, within health and protection funding, because right now we're not seeing that. Um, also earmarking of funding for the most vulnerable groups, which as Dr. Samari explained in these countries um, include LGBTQI people, rural women and girls, IDP refugee and migrant women and girls, Afro-descendant women and girls, sex workers, people living with HIV, people living with disabilities, often left out of these conversations. Um, and inclusion of GBV and SRHR earmarks and indicators in IFI, International Financial Institution Financing, that goes beyond the typical lip service that um, the GBV gets in preventing sexual exploitation commitments on implementation, but actually make uh, GVB prevention and response part of um, the project design for, for this funding. And lastly, greater transparency about how COVID response pooled funds are used. Uh, what's the decision-making process? What and who is being funded at what amount? Um, which is particularly important in places like 
Nigeria, where you have the one UN basket, South Africa, where you have the solid solidarity fund, et cetera. There's a really huge gaps in accountability and priorities. And I'll hand back over to Dr. Casey for Q&A and we'll wrap up. Great, thank you. So I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question or put something into the chat if that's easier. Hi, um, I have a methodological question. Maybe I'll put on my video to say hello. Sorry, I'm just on my couch at lunch. But um, I'm curious, uh, I've been thinking a lot about mixed methods and order of doing things. And I'm curious about the order that you did the different methods and how they fed into one another and the sort of the design that way, just out of curiosity. Sarah, I'll be waiting for a few questions, okay. Ravi. No, go ahead. I think let's go ahead. And please, uh, Dr. Samari, others, please join in. I think in this case, I wouldn't say it was a traditionally, you know, mixed methods design study. We did end up, you know, we did use qualitative data, which was supposed to be our primary data collection method, uh, because we really wanted to understand the nuances of what was going on on the ground. And but because we also wanted to sort of supplement some of the qualitative work that we did, uh, just to give, give it a little more heft, we sort of did the survey analysis, uh, which just gives us some numerical idea of what was going on. So it wasn't, uh, you know, traditionally, we, we didn't really plan it. Uh, so it didn't really matter which came first, but clearly for us, it was the, it was the qualitative research piece that was really the, the main piece. And then we did the add-on uh, survey analysis to capture some additional, uh, you know, responses and some additional uh, just to strengthen the argument, I think that was the way it was. As opposed to, I think in a many in many cases you do a, a, a lot longer survey and then you do mixed methods to sort of explain some of your, you do the qualitative piece to some explain some of your numbers. I think for us it was the opposite. We started with the qualitative work. We were interested in sort of understanding uh, the nuances of what was going on on the ground, and the numbers sort of supported some of the things that we were sort of trying to. The arguments we were making on the qualitative side, but I've seen it most traditionally used the opposite way, or at least I have used it in the other way, where you know I've done a longer survey and I've then then done the uh, qualitative piece uh, to sort of understand what the numbers exactly mean. In this case, I think it was a little in the opposite direction, uh, but I think it also had to do with COVID and the fact that we were sort of speaking to service providers and program managers. We were not really directly going to women. Uh, and sort of trying to estimate prevalence, but more understanding the barriers that people were facing in terms of accessing, uh, you know, health services. That's how I sort of think about it. I don't know if others want to add. So I'll just add one thing. I, I agree, uh, just timeline wise, the qualitative and quantitative pieces were deployed sort of simultaneously. So we were gaining the survey responses and responses to the questionnaire at the same time that the interviews were being conducted. It's really interesting now having the findings for both because the quantitative piece really shows some trend information that's actually further exemplified and like shown in detailed examples and explanations through the qualitative portion. So we see the same things, disruptions in service provision, strain on staffing, supply chain disruptions in the quantitative piece. And then we have these really illustrative examples in the qualitative piece that further show that. So even though the study wasn't necessarily designed in the same way and both were in the field simultaneously, it is really interesting how the findings are essentially the exact same and really reflective of one another. Just jump in to add one more thing, which is that in several of the countries, the work on COVID response 2020, built on a deeper survey that looked at uh, GBV policy and response and funding over the previous five years. So it's really thinking about the 2020 data in terms of what we knew about trends um, in what was happening in each of these countries. Thanks. Any, anyone else 
have a question for the team? Hi, everyone. Congratulations on such uh, an important body of work. It's really impressive how quickly you gathered so much um, diverse information from so many different stakeholders. Um, I was wondering about uh, something that was on uh, Clarissa's last slide around this whole chasm between policy and implementation. And I wondered if you all had, uh, I mean, we see that in other arenas of public health, right? It's sort of one of the biggest challenges in the work that we do. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts um, about how to improve that chasm or if your stakeholders had any thoughts as you were interviewing them. I give it <laughs> I'm happy to start. I mean, it's I guess it's it's such a you know difficult question to answer. And I you 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 would think the answer is so simple as communication, but but that's really you know not what we see on the ground. And we we really saw it in this situation, a lot of confusion around you know what was essential versus non-essential. And even for us, like as we were sort of going through the qualitative interview, you know, the interview materials and looking at some of the guidelines that the government had sort of put in place, we, we, see, we saw so many contradictions and what we were hearing from the stakeholders who are providing these services on the ground versus what you know, the government documents were saying to the, to the extent that some of the stakeholders providing these services were not even aware that such a document had come out, uh, which sort of gave you these. So, I, you know, so when it's a situation like that, it's, it just seems like clearly, you know, the stakeholders, and this is something that definitely came out in the interviews, is that there was no consultation process that was done. And one of the biggest criticism of the groups was that right in the beginning, as things were happening with COVID, none of the GBV or SRH stakeholders were included in the discussions about how you know you would integrate GBV and SRH services within the within the COVID response. And things changed only down the line as there was you know. Uh, uh, at least a perception that GB was, is, was increasing. Some of the cases came into media attention. And so there was a lot of, you know, attention drawn. And this is across the board in all the countries, which is, you know, another interesting piece. And it's that it's at that point that government started making statements, coming out with documents. But clearly, uh, there was still communication wasn't happening. And there was a lot of confusion. Uh, so, I mean, I guess I don't really have any, I don't exactly know what the solutions are, but... Mm -hmm definitely is there and communication and I guess involving stakeholders is is key but why this doesn't happen is another matter. The other thing I would just highlight is as we know in public health like social determinants of health are really big drivers and this work particularly like the transportation results so you might have some you might even have a policy that SRH and GBV are essential, but if you haven't thought through like how that works, particularly for underserved and vulnerable groups, and there's still going to be these, what I would think of as implementation obstacles, like if the transportation doesn't exist or there's curfews that really interfere with people's access to services or shelters, then you're still going to ultimately have the same issues. And so I think it's about thinking a little bit more holistically about the meaning of the policies that are put into place and the impacts that they have on people's lives while, you know, having that social and structural determinants of health framework in mind, it just emerged over and over again, that, like these basic things like transportation really prevented people from getting what they needed. And on the funding and project driven side, um, this lack of earmarking, I think has been crucial in whether or not funds actually end up going to GBV and, and which SRHR services. And when you think about the huge burdens on implementers um, to, you know, with very few resources, having to make some of those, those calls um, and not having accountability mechanisms to follow up on that. So, um, you know, if, if, you're, uh, if you're an NGO implementer providing GBV services and referrals and you're struggling to, uh, to provide your services and on top of that, keep track of the fact that police and, and courts aren't doing their jobs and try to do advocacy around that, you know, just the, the incredible 
often unfunded burdens that were on uh, service providers, activists, feminist groups, women's rights groups, LGBTQ groups to um, sustain themselves, service their communities, and do advocacy and accountability work and fundraise. Thanks. Does someone else have a question? Hey, Esther. Uh, Esther, we cannot hear you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so congrats again to, to everybody um, on the great work. Um, I have a, a methodology question as well. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you did this sort of tracing um, of different funding, um, yeah, mechanisms, donors, amounts, um, and how you sort of went about that. Was it just a review of documents? Were you talking to people and tracing the sort of funding sources that way? Um, yeah, any tips or advice for someone else? Um, me, I was <laughs> trying to do something similar as well. Thank you. So the funding streams uh, for this period has been primarily desk research. So um, looking through the humanitarian tracking um, foundation directories, um, UN agencies, uh, private donors, um, websites and reporting, uh, a range of, so those types of scans and then also going, do, looking at that against strategy documents. So global appeals and their updates, what's included, what's not included, um, websites of service providers as how they describe their work and the funding streams coming to them. Um, it's really difficult in, in terms of nailing down some of the stuff because there's so little transparency in the sector. And there's very, very poor coding, which is one of the reasons that we continue to push earmarking and better indicators and specificity about what essential services mean. Um, often that seems, if we, if we look at some of the, the strategy documents, um, it seems like it's intentionally fuzzy. Uh, we captured some of this information as well, complementary information in the first round of interviews. What we're about to start is a second round of deeper dive interviews with um, some of the donors and, uh, and NGOs who were part of, who we captured information about in the first round of surveys, but haven't done a full, you know, download uh, um, of what their experience have been, especially because I think we see specifically on the funding uh, a somewhat uptick in the second half of the year, um, but it seems to be quite specific to certain types of funding. Um, for example, the, the Gates um, as, uh, HIV and, and maternal health funding and the, the piece of that that's linked to vaccine development. Thanks, Clarissa. Um, other questions? Um, one thing I was going to ask, and feel free to jump in if someone else does have a question, was I wondered if you could talk, and I know this is something we still have um, under discussion, but I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how we've been thinking about next steps and how to use some of these data or share it back to um, people who can use the information. Yes, happy to start and others can join. So in terms of you know, next steps for us, in terms of products that we hope to see uh, and, and who's gonna use them. So we are sort of working on two page short briefs, uh, you know, sort of synthesizing information from all of the different, you know, different briefs for each of the countries, synthesizing the information from the different elements uh, so that they can easily be used by stakeholders on the ground 
uh, for advocacy. Uh, so that's one aspect. And we probably have a separate uh, separate one for the programs and services and another one for funding uh, that'll be tar And we're hoping to, you know, involve uh, the stakeholders in these discussions as we sort of lay out these products so that we have a better sense of what they would need uh, for, to do advocacy. And then of course, you know, since we are a research institution, we are also sort of working on our peer reviewed publications and hoping to uh, have a couple of papers on each of the different countries and then maybe also do some global papers sort of more broadly, you know, looking at trends across the countries and what that means uh, for service provision during emergencies. And then, of course, down the line, we hope if we can get more funding, uh, be able to also look at what's going on now because we sort of captured the first six months of COVID. And uh, luckily, just the way uh, the way uh, things worked out, we uh, went sort of towards the tail end of the the six months. So we got a you know good sense of what was happening from the beginning to that point. But we'd be interested to also see you know if things have improved. Uh, hopefully, they have uh, because people were really pivoting and trying to make the best of the situation. And uh, we we you know so it will be. Uh, uh, if we get the opportunity, we'd definitely like to go back and do some additional uh, digging and see how things have changed and if there's been any improvement uh, from the time that we were there. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Maybe just to to not a, to to follow up on the next step points. I mean, one of the one of the bodies of work that the program has has been around the global gag rule. So part of what we've talked about for next steps would be looking at how the lifting of the global gag rule does or doesn't impact um, service provision and what would need to be done how, how could one best address the negative structural um, issues that were created by the global gag rule that don't go away themselves so thinking forward looking in a pandemic and post pandemic uh, situation what would need to happen to really effectively improve conditions on the ground post lifting of the global gag rule. Great, thanks. All right, so I'd like to thank everyone for coming today and thank our panelists um, for sharing this, um, these case studies that we've done in, in these few countries um, and have a good afternoon. For those of you in New York, enjoy the snow. Thank you.